Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Spencerport Central School District Board of Education meeting, Tuesday, April 26, 2022. Please join me to pledge the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Okay, our next item on the agenda for tonight is approval of the agenda. Gary? Present. All in favor? Five vote. Thank you. And Superintendent Swan. So uh, for the community members who are with us tonight, we have enjoyed over the last few months recognizing certain students and groups in our district. And as a new superintendent, one area um, of real uh, bright spot in our school district is the amount of service and community outreach that our students provide. Um, I see it in different clubs and activities and athletics. And so I was really hoping that our high school service club would be able to be recognized um, today at the board meeting and to share a little bit about their club. We have two students with us tonight. So I'm going to ask Mr. McCabe, who's also here, um, to come to the podium and bring our colleagues, yes, and, and the students, um, to share a little bit about the service club and the wonderful work that our high school students are doing. Thank you, Ms. Swan. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and, and like Ms. Swan said, we're blessed to have so many students and organizations that give back so much to the community. Um, and so tonight, uh, we have the service club. Our advisors for the service club are Mr. Gerhardt and Ms. Morris. Who've done that for God? How long has this been, Phil? Uh, 18. 18, 18 years. 18 years. Wow. Uh, and, and have done so many great things for our community. And so tonight we have Phil here to talk a little bit. And we have Alyssa Sugar, who's an 11th grader, and Robert Laduca, who's a 10th grader. Um, and so they will take over from here. Okay. Evening, everybody. Thanks for having us. Um, so Nikki Morris and I started the service club, like I said, I think it was 18 years ago. Um, and it's really evolved over the years. You know, it, it started off with us doing primarily just things within the school building. And then over time, um, elementary schools would ask us to help out with Halloween parties and book um, uh, sales and things like that. And then a few years ago, actually, I think about 12 years ago, uh, another social studies teacher, Rick Mueller, said uh, Disney offers these great programs um, where students come down and the park is basically the classroom, the theme parks are the classroom. And he went to you know, Mr. Zinkwich, who was our principal at the time, and, and he said, well, why don't you hook up with a club that has good students, which we always do. Um, and so we, um, we started 12 years ago doing this trip about every other year where we, we take students down, we, we use, um, where we sign up for a couple of programs. Uh, they used to be called YES programs, Youth Education Series. Now they've rebranded them as um, Imagination Campus. And uh, they use the parks to teach things related to STEM, things related to leadership. Um, uh, it is a great experience. And one of the things that we do uh, when we take students down, it's about a year and a half process of planning to get down there, um, is we ask the students um, who are usually already members of service club to commit to certain service activities, just to show that they're not here just to go to meet Mickey Mouse. And, um, and once and they do that, you know, over the course of about a year or so, and then we go down to the parks um, and, and have fun. It's been kind of uh, difficult the last couple of years, obviously, with COVID to try to do service activities. We basically really weren't able to do anything last year. And this year, there was still kind of a, a struggle to find things. The elementary schools are great um, about always asking us for help. But even that was difficult earlier in the year. Um, we're actually doing this Saturday our first I think like full group event in, the, in two years where we're, we're working with the village to do some cleaning up around um, with spring cleanup type stuff. Um, and so, so it's been kind of a challenge, but, but we've been, you know, plugging along um, this entire time. Uh, got two, uh, two of the 33 students that went with us this year is actually our largest group going to Disney. Um, and they'll just kind of tell you what they did with um, the, the programs and what they did actually to, leading up to, to go on the trip. So, doesn't matter. Um, so I've been in service club since ninth grade, and one of my favorite service club activities was um, 
volunteering to babysit the kids during um, parent meetings at, at Cosgrove Middle School. And I also enjoyed volunteering at Vacation Bible School. Um, it was a fun time helping kids and um, working with them. Uh, I also volunteered um, with um, Sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Special Olympics um, last year, uh, to helping them with the sports and also competing with them and against them. Um, and the Service Club program is a great program to just uh, get out there and like, feel like you're helping the community. I would say my favorite service event was probably working at the zoo during the right around Halloween because obviously during COVID it was it was hard to get groups of people together, but at the zoo it was great because people could walk around, do social distance, and be with their family. I helped hand out candy, and I also I worked with a woman, and over the course of three hours we ended up getting very close because we were standing there side by side handing out candy to kids and. It was just a great experience to put myself out there. Um, and what better place to learn was Disney World. Um, because we got to, the Disney employees were great, very hands-on, and that was a great place to learn leadership. And just, I've always loved Disney a lot. Um, and it definitely, they kind of used the program to plug their Disney college program, which is students going and working for them for some time. And that definitely got me very interested in that for the future. So looking forward to that someday. But thank you. Um, this year they did, uh, what was it? <coughs> theme park design, correct? And then um, a, another leadership program. But in the past, we've done um, programs related to zoology. Zoo, yeah, zoology, I guess is the word. Um, where we went to Animal Kingdom and we actually go behind the scenes, like where they're taking care of the elephants and stuff like that. So, so it's a really cool program. Um, you know, and, and I definitely know that some students, you know, have left over the years have left, um, you know, Disney and they've said, you know what, this actually kind of gave me an idea of what I might want to do. So um, there's definitely some value and I really appreciate the support that you guys give, you know, every time we um, ask to go on this trip. So, um, cause I know that that's a, something that students really look forward to each year um, or each, every other year while we do it. So thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Just thinking before our students came up, um, Rick and I have been presenting the budget to certain groups, and we always start with our mission. And you know, part of that mission is helping to our students love learning, but it's also to create opportunities that help build confidence in them and give them the experiences to be contributing community members. And I think that this is a great connection to that. So. Thank you for the board too for supporting this type of endeavors for our students. Yeah, it's a great opportunity for students to learn the importance of giving back to their community and volunteer service hours. It's a great program that obviously has been very strong in our school. And looking forward to hearing more from them. So thank you for making that happen tonight. Okay, um, next item on the agenda is Board of Education. I'll turn it over to Mr. Bracken. <clears throat> yeah, so looking around the room, I think most of the people in the room already know about this, but um, at our last meeting, uh, we kind of made a mistake in not following our own uh, board policies. Uh, when Mr. Hutton <clears throat> resigned the presidency, um, there should not have been a open nominations, uh, call for nominations and such. Uh, it, was, it was supposed to be strictly right to uh, that the vice president would take over the duties of president for the remainder of the year. So to rectify that, we are going to, um, I'm gonna to ask to rescind that vote um, and then turn the meeting back over to uh, to our vice president. So uh, and do we need to actually vote on this? Okay. Mm -hmm. We have a motion to rescind the vote of uh, our previous meeting. I'll make a motion to rescind the vote from the previous meeting. Second. Okay. All in favor? 
David, you David? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. All right. Bye, Bob. And with that, back to you, sir. Okay. Great. So Tim is just going to pull up uh, a visual graphic for me. So one of the pieces of information that I shared in using notes um, was also some work that I've been doing that's in regards to war composition. Thank you, Troy. And I know throughout um, the past few weeks with uh, Kevin Hines' uh, resignation, there's just been questions about filling this vacancy, what's the proper procedure? So I just want to go through some of that. Um, so some of the questions are, are school districts obligated to fill a vacancy? If so, what should the procedures be? And what are the vice president duties? We just talked a little bit about that. So should a school district fill the vacancy? Technically, the answer is yes. And I'm just going to get my notes if you'll bear with me for a moment. Technically, uh, the answer is yes. The law imposes upon the district the power and the duty to fill a vacancy. In our situation in Spencerport, given the time frame, um, it's a little bit difficult because, or or a conversation that needs to be had because the board does not have to appoint an individual to the vacancy now because the election is within 90 days. So there's. Um, you know, a time period there that impacts this decision. What we talked about at our last meeting is that the board may want to consider appointment if there's concerns about having a quorum or anticipating any type of voting problem in the next few meetings. <coughs> so then how is a, what is the procedure to fill a vacancy? So typically the board can either call a special election or fill the vacancy within 90 days that it occurs, or appoint a qualified individual. The district superintendent can also appoint a qualified individual if a board didn't act within 90 days of the vacancy. So it's a special election, an appointment, or the district superintendent can appoint. We had been talking about the appointment again at our last meeting. So what Gary shared is um, both in our policy, but also statute on this point, are the vice president duties. Um, so our policy 1322 mirrors the statute and I'll let you just have a moment to read it. <laughs> Essentially stating that the vice president takes on the duties of the president when that um, seat is vacant. So again, the board corrected this by withdrawing the previous election. Um, just so you're aware, because we did ask, the, board, the vice president does not need to take an oath um, because again, they're administering the duties of the president as the vice president. No. So then the elections, um, how is a school board member elected? How might elections impact the board vacancy? And when does the new board member take office? So how are board members elected? They're elected either at an annual or a special school district meeting. Essentially in Spencerport, we have at large seats, meaning that the candidate with the highest number of votes is going to be entitled to the position with the longest length. We're not voting for a particular seat. They're all at large, they're whatever vote um, seats are open. So in our situation, um, and if you look right at this column, <coughs> we have um, different vacancies as of the annual meeting. We'll have uh, three open seats that people will be voting on. At the time of the vacancy, we have one seat that would be vacant, um, Mr. Hutton's seat. And then at the time of regular, um, oh, excuse me, time frames, 
Um, the seat that is going to be open is a three year term. The other seat is a three year term, and Kevin's seat would be a two year term. So, in this situation, um, the voter who received the highest number of votes would go into seat one or seat two. Now, any one of these seats. The second person who received the highest number of votes would go into seat two. And then the third highest uh, vote bidder would move into seat three. The caveat with seat three is that that would start immediately. So that person would take the oath um, upon the next board meeting and move into that seat and fill these 44 remaining days as well as the two year uh, to your term. So, so, Ms. Monson, this, this is different than what we heard before. This, this is different. It is. Yeah, so. It is. And um, Dave, as I shared in these yep. notes, you know, the complexity, and I'm going to share mm -hmm. another scenario. It does get a little bit complex when the terms start and when they mm -hmm. don't start. So, in this case, we would have two terms that started July 1st, mm -hmm. and we would have a seat that would start immediately. The uh, misconception that we had is that if a board member was appointed, that they would finish out the school year. And that is not correct. Yeah. If, a, if a board member, if a board appoints a qualified individual, they only serve until the election. Wait, you, you lost me there. I'm sorry. Okay. Back up an inch. So our, our misunderstanding oh, at our last right, meeting right, right. was what would happen if the board appointed appointed somebody, right. how long would that person serve? Would they serve until July 1st? And then the uh, third highest vote getter would take Mr. Hunton's seat. That's not correct. Right. That was yes. an yeah. error. And I just want to be yeah. really clear Got around it. that. That's why I understood it through your notes. Yeah. Yeah. So in a different scenario, let's say we're, we're talking about seat one. And this is an incumbent. Um, if that person were not to receive the highest votes, let's just say hypothetically, they received the third highest votes, the board member, the incumbent, would take their seat and actually they would relinquish their seat. They would take this seat of 44 days in two years. And then you would have an opening at seat one. So then you have another vacancy here that would need to be filled. That would be filled by the person who received the highest number of votes. They would start immediately as well and then finish out the term for three years. So there is a, is a possibility in a scenario in which two of the seats would start immediately and then fill the remaining of the term. And that's where the misconception came in regards to when people would start, why they would start immediately, why they would maybe start in July. So those are the scenarios in which we um, discussed with our legal counsel, gained a greater understanding about. So again, I apologize for last meeting and any confusion that um, our understanding may have caused the board. Does this visual help and, and make those scenarios a little bit clearer? Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions? No other questions? Oh, oh and I okay. just want to share. I, I apologize. So we talked about this. If if the board chose to appoint to fill the vacancy, that person would only serve until the election in May. And again, the third highest voter would take the office. Okay. Any further questions? Well, yes, I mean, we did have a vote to appoint. Right. So are we rescinding the vote? We did. No, Wait. we rescinded no. Yeah. The leadership of the board. Right. Right. So there was a vote that passed by two. Right. Yeah. For, for Mr. Maselli. Oh, correct. Right. So the, the point. So, so we can rescind that vote. 
as long as we're going to have quorum at our next meeting. One of, the, one of the reasons why we did that was the concern for quorum. So technically, he would only be coming to the next meeting, which would be next week, the third, because the vote is the 17th, and then our next meeting is, I believe, the 26th. Well, my, my thing is that my decision was based upon the information that was given to us last meeting, right. all kind of woven in there. Now we're kind of dividing things up. So my perception by evolving information is kind of changing. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, you know, yeah. so um, in my opinion, I think we should rescind it because it's based on new information. Because if I knew this, then I would have a different take right. on it. Yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, right. you can yeah. only serve one or two meetings. So yeah. make it just make sense. technically yeah. he would be serving one. Yeah. yeah. The thing yeah. was that we'd have coverage. Yeah, yeah. 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 Based right. on two weeks ago's right. information, but this right here different is different information that yeah. we were given. Exactly. Different parameters. So yeah. Yeah. I would I, I'm with you. I agree so, because I stand by my original position that yeah. we should not yeah. have been in the business of appointing someone so close to an election anyhow. The special thing about elections is that it's our community's chance to right. elect someone to this board. Right. And appointing someone to serve for one or two meetings and right. then having to take that back is just it's yeah. silly. Absolutely. And I'm I'm feeling the same way at this point that um is you know our concern was quorum. That was one of the biggest concerns, making sure that we have quorum for our meetings. But at this point, if we feel like we want to rescind that, we'll have to have someone make a motion. Yeah. Motion to rescind. Yeah. I'll okay. second. I'll second. Any other questions? All in favor? Bye bye. You know, Greg, um, I don't know if we should, how can I say this nicely, um, <coughs> preserving the quorum, should, I don't think for me should be a prayer for making a decision, but we do. And we have six people. Right. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't do things to make sure we protect us for a quorum. I know it could be a big wrench to gears, but it should be based on our ethics and morals and right. objectivity, not we no. need four people. We need four warm bodies. Right. You know, right. well, and we no. do. There is law that you can vote via teleconferencing, so it's mm -hmm. not that if you couldn't. I mean, it, I know there was concern about the governor's, you know, stay, but that's actually not the case. In open meeting law, you can vote via teleconferencing right. as long as you disclose your location in ahead of time. So you can't, you know, the whole board couldn't be remote. But that's been in law since about what 2017, 2018, the right. school law. So, Marcy, is there anything we can't vote uh, through Zoom, or is there any exceptions to that? Currently, the governor has extended the date Got it. that you could participate by Zoom. Got it. But your reference, I think, the tele um, your video, I think, would have to be on. In pre prior to COVID, you would have to be in a public place. You have to do your address. Test. You have to disclose your address. No, prior to COVID, you would have to be in a public place, like tops or something, a restaurant, Russia, something okay, like that. Okay. If yeah. you were going to, if you were going to, you would have to give your address. And if somebody wanted to attend, even if it was in your own home, right? Could, but somebody yeah. would have to be able to publicly attend yeah. where if, you are located, yes, yeah. in order to vote. But now, now yes, you can participate. Now it's open to so the governor of, right. changes that, mm -hmm. and that's. Temporarily permanent or permanently temporarily or she extends it. So it just yeah. keeps keeps, yeah. Yeah. So so, so. so that's news to me. So I mean, that even makes my right. decision more right. And yeah. some of the more detailed information we did receive puts us in a much better spot. And we're doing the right thing. Absolutely. Any other questions or thoughts before we move on? Thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate that. So the next portion of our agenda is privilege of the floor. And um, during this time, residents of the district may make an appointment to address the board. Pre-registration is required on a first come first serve basis for the five available openings. Remarks should be limited to two to five minutes. The board will listen to input, but not respond, except to refer any specific concerns to the superintendent for follow-up. Questions should be answered within a week, if possible. Speakers uh, will please give their name, address, and phone number. The clerk will record this. So we have one uh, privilege of the floor speaker tonight is Mr. Donald Bardeen. Mr. Bardeen, if you would make your way to the podium and um, give us your address, uh, your name, address, and phone number, and um, we'll give you that full five minutes. Thank you. My name is Donald Bardeen. 
I live at Six Ridge Meadows Drive in Spencerport, New York. And my phone number is 585-414-9987. Uh, I will address the uh, board tonight uh, concerning uh, a response from my last uh, speaking at the board was February 15th. I re received a response on March 8th from Mr. Butler. I'd like to respond to that tonight. And I'll start by quickly reviewing just quickly the four questions I asked at the February 15th meeting were, for whom does the school board work? How is the New York State funding for the Spudsport School District determined? Do parents or legal guardians have the final say concerning the education of their children? And how does the Spudsport School District determine the culture of a student? On March 8th, I received a letter from Mr. Hutton, which yeah. I'll read it to you. I don't have the whole thing, of course. As you are likely aware, school districts are not required to conduct privileges of the floor, but it is important to us to listen and consider the perspectives of our learning community. In addition, school boards are not required to respond to speakers' questions. However, we have made every effort to provide responses and resources to your arbitrary questions. If you have an end goal or overarching purpose for your appearances, please communicate that as we are still unclear as to your direction or views you want to share. The questions you pose at the February 15th meeting may be researched through the New York State School Board Association website or the New York State Education Department, and we have provided those links for your convenience. Parents and legal guardians certain, certainly should think, educate their children outside the school day, and the district welcomes input regarding specific needs. During the instructional day, the district operates in accordance with its policies and practices as well as state and federal laws and regulations governing education. As far as your last question, is it unclear what information is being sought? <coughs> question one. This is my opinion. You can comment one way or the other on it, and please respond to me by email. School board members are locally elected public officials entrusted with governing a community's public schools. The role of the school board is to ensure that school districts are responsive to the values beliefs and priorities of their communities, not the state. Question two, I'm going to do some research on that and I'll get back to you on the funding. Question three, by your answer, during this instructional day, you believe the school district and New York State has the final say concerning the education of our children. I refer you to a 1974 federal law, the Protection of Pupil Rights Amendment, 20 USC and 1232H. I believe every parent in our school district should be made aware of this law and how to use it. <coughs> I believe parents have the final say in the education of their children all day, every day. Question four, the culture of a student should not be determined based on the color of their skin nor their social or economic background. Does the school board agree with this statement or not? And so in order to implement a culturally responsive education, how is the culture of a student determined? You asked about my direction or views. I do not believe that our country or the constitution on which it is founded is systemically racist. I also believe that the New York State CRSE, culturally responsive sustainable education framework is fundamentally flawed. I invite you to ask me for clarification on this and suggest an open format where both you and any member of our community may engage in open dialogue concerning the subject. My questions are not arbitrary, but fundamental in establishing the foundation of our educational system. My end goal is to identify and have removed from our school district policies and programs that do not align with the basic values of our community. Is there any, I know you, you don't want to ask me questions on that. Um, I, I, I just realized, I don't think I included these notes in what I turned in. So if you would like me to leave a copy of these notes, I'd be happy to. Marcy, would you like a copy of these notes? I'll, I'll leave them for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I just apologize to you. Um, this is a, a, an honest admission on my part. I forgot to bring my hearing piece. So I've not hearing much of anything is said. So if you please forgive me, I'm probably going to take my coat and, and leave at this time, because there's no sense in my sitting here just to, Take up space, not my head. Right, but I do appreciate. I, and please understand, I'm not. I'm not looking for a battle here. But you ask for clarification, and I hope that this gives it to you. But please, 
respond to me. I, I in fact, I want you to respond to me so I can we can go further with this if, if there's questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sergeant. You, Appreciate your time. I'll grab it later. Thank you, Mr. Burton. I will grab it. <laughs> Thank you. And do you have a copy of the original letter that went to Mr. Burton? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, we do have a copy. Yep, we do have a copy. So we're good to go. Okay. Uh, ne next item on the agenda is the consent agenda, and uh, our consent agenda is just, well, we don't have any high school students here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the consent agenda, we, um, I'm going to need a motion for the consent agenda, as, as well as the personnel action certificated addendum that we received prior to tonight's meeting. Motion to approve consent agenda to include the personnel action certificated addendum. Second. Second. Any other questions or concerns? All in favor? By vote. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is our Board of Education. So uh, 7.1, President's Report and Communication. We'll call that Vice President. Right. A um, couple of items that I just want to um, uh, share out with the board. Um, I was really excited to see the flag football season kick off with the Buffalo Bills this past weekend. I don't know if anybody saw that on Twitter, but a group of our flag football uh, student athletes had the opportunity to kick off the flag football season uh, in the training facility with the Buffalo Bills along right? with other schools yeah. in the state that are participating in this program. Yeah. So. Saw some great pictures of, of, of that celebration and that opportunity for them to learn more. And I bring that up because they did such an outstanding, uh, gave us such an outstanding presentation probably a month and a half ago. And it's really exciting to see this coming to um, fruition. So I um, was really excited to see that. Uh, just a quick reminder that we do meet again next week, May 3rd. You know, usually it's every two weeks, but because of the calendar in May and with the budget vote, we're meeting again next week. And I believe we start at 6.30. Am I correct for that, Marcy? With the budget right? hearing. Yeah, with the budget hearing. Exactly. And we'll hear more about that a little bit. And lastly, I did attend the district safety committee meeting this afternoon. Um, they gave, uh, Darren and Jonathan gave some updates with our school district security and also some uh, updates about our security assessment. So other than that, anyone else have anything to share with the board, Gary? Yeah, just real quick, um, the N uh, NCSBA annual wrap up meeting and stuff is at the end of May on the last Wednesday. It'll be at Ridgemont uh, Country Club. Uh, a group of our musicians from the high school will um, entertain at the very beginning of it. So I'd um, like to urge everybody to attend if you can. Um, and also, it's not too early to think about uh, New York State School Board Association's uh, annual convention and education expo is October 27 through 29 in Syracuse this year. So a little easier to get to. Um, they'll open up registration for that, I believe, mid-August or so, sometime around that, if you have a desire to go attend it. <laughs> I've been a couple of years. It's, it's pretty interesting stuff that you get to sit and more about. So um, that's about it, Greg. Thank you. Good morning. No report. Yeah. No report. Thank you. No, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, at this point, we're gonna get our superintendent's report. So I will turn it over to superintendent's report. Right, Thank, Thank you. you. So we have um, quite a bit of organizational work to get through um, this evening. So first on our agenda is establishing dates for organizational meeting. Um, we are recommending a resolution to establish the 22-23 Board of Education organizational meeting uh, dates on Tuesday, July 12th. Um, that will help us avoid the, the first Tuesday in July is July 5th. So it helps avoid any conflict that may occur due to people vacationing for 4th of July. Um, you would have received that memo in our uh, board docket. So, if there aren't any questions, motion to set the date July 12th. Second. 
Any other questions? No. All in favor? Five vote. Thank you. And that's six o'clock, right? Yes. I'm sorry. It was six. Six o'clock. Mm -hmm. yeah. The um, next item on our agenda is the election of our BOCES two candidates. Um, so again, this was information in news and notes earlier in April. And for those of you who attended the annual meeting with BOCES, you had a chance to hear the nominations of the candidates. Um, so again, if there aren't any um, questions, we'll take the vote or the board will need to vote on those candidates. Okay. Motion to vote on the uh, OCs two local election candidates. And so we have um, each vote is separate. So the first being for Gerald Marr. Okay. Motion for Gerald Marr. Gerald Marr. Second. Oh, I can second. Okay, thank you. The second is for. Um, Dennis Lava, the resident of East Twilight Central School District. Motion for Dennis Lava. Second. Second. All in favor? All in and the third is for Trina Lorenz. She's the resident of the Holland Central School District. Same motion for Trina. Second. Second. All in favor? Thank you. Then the um, final BOCES piece of business that we're um, asking the board to vote on is uh, the BOCES 2 administrative budget. Again, that information was also in news and notes earlier in April. Um, board members had a chance to um, receive that information both in news and notes and in the meeting. So I'm wondering first if there's any questions. So we'll ask the board then to make a right, motion to accept the bosses to administrative budget. Second. All in favor? Five vote. Thank you. So the next um, piece of business is determining the order for placement on the ballot of the candidates who are running. Now I will um, sort of let Marcy take over this portion. Okay, thank you. So we have um, five candidates this year. Um, I have my little secure location here. <laughs> um, I can assure you there are five slips of paper. They're all folded the exact same way. Um, I mix them up and I'm going to ask Lynette Cypher to help me. Um, so the person that gets picked out of the basket first will be placed first on the ballot and then so forth down to number five. And the first candidate, Michael Maselli, will be number one on the ballot. <laughs> Michael Mayer will be number two on the ballot. Gary Bracken will be number three on the ballot. Megan Sarkis will be number four on the ballot. And Christopher Spolina will be number five on the ballot. I see that we have a few candidates here. So if anybody is wishing to view the pieces of paper, um, they are all the exact same size and they're all folded the same way, okay? All right, congratulations. Thank you, Lynette. The next agenda, um, 8.5, is the process and the agenda for the budget hearing and the Meet the Candidates night. Um, so again, I had shared some past agendas with the board through news and notes of how the Meet the Candidates night has been um, framed in, in the past. Just to review that information, uh, usually the at the budget hearing and the Meet the Candidates Forum, uh, we usually start with the proposed budget presentation by myself, 
and then uh, answer any questions, if have any questions or answers of the budget. And then we move into the meet the candidates portion of the evening. And so what that's looked like historically is a welcome by Marcy and then an opportunity for the community to meet the candidates, have the candidates introduce themselves. Um, each candidate usually has two or three minutes to introduce themselves and then a few minutes to answer a question that's posed to all of the candidates. Um, I know that typically at this meeting, the board engages in a conversation around the setup and the framework of the Meet the Candidates Night. So uh, I welcome us to have that conversation. If you have questions or ideas that you may want to suggest for that forum. Leah, I know you had some suggestions. Would you be willing to? Sure, those I would with just. For those of you who remember last year, we had it uh, done via Zoom pretty much. So it was videotaped and we were seated um, and you were alternating the first question. But after that, we were in the same order. So you always answered after the same person. So you might have started a question first, but then the second response followed just in a line. I would, I know it's more difficult in order to alternate that, but I would suggest having that randomized more so that you're not always answering before or after the same person. Um, I think that changes, you're not always following. So in other words, if I answered first and then Mike was always following me, right? Or vice versa. So I think it would be better to randomize that. I did ask if we could tell the candidates if they're seated or standing. I know that sounds like a little thing, but you know, if you come in thinking you're standing and you were like me and in a dress, it became complicated to <laughs> know where your camera angle is. Um, and I had one other suggestion, but I can't remember what it was. There we go. I guess it will come to me. But in terms of, um, oh, I know what it was. It would be, and I, this is hard room, so this would be a more of a tech issue. If you could face the audience when speaking as opposed to just looking at a screen i think that would be helpful to the candidates mm -hmm. as opposed to just you know before the we were it was reversed so people were sitting behind the candidates so we were just looking toward the camera and i think it would be more beneficial to switch that around if possible again i don't know where the tech is here but so Leah, I have a question for you. Uh, refresh my memory on this. Did each of you as candidates get an opportunity to answer first? So yes. Okay. So that was randomized first. So okay. everybody got a chance to answer first, but yep. after that, it just broke. So it just went in the line. Yeah. So if Dave answered first, right. then me, then Lori. Right. Then it would be me, then Lori, then Dave. So you always followed the same person. Yeah. The first time I ran, um, we had to meet the candidate. Right? I think we had five candidates or six even, and we sat at these tables and the tables that were set up like this and we did face the audience mm -hmm. and we did all get a chance to answer first at least once which i think is really important I think so too. but again we went down the road so the gentleman that was right next to me after i spoke he spoke and then after he spoke i spoke so i think that would be i, I like that suggestion of making it a little more random so you're not ahead of the same person or following the same person so it's a, a little how do i fairly randomize without anybody perhaps thinking that I'm, you have to bring your easter back i was going to say <laughs> could you pick, we could I'll pick do names it. every time but then that would possibly we'll take away the first yeah. no, I, the answer opportunity for everybody i think i think a lot of that too might be how people are seated could determine how you do that depending on i think um, last year we only had zoom yeah 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 you were seated in front of the camera right. because that was the audience. no there was an audience behind behind us it's just few people that right. yeah attend but mm -hmm. right, we were doing it for right. zoom last year i think also it will depend on how many people actually come yeah. as well right. you know we have five candidates where we have you know, I think five they, here. so i do know that mr mayor has already informed me that he had a planned out of town right. um trip this year so yeah, i'm in florida yeah so he won't be <laughs> able to attend i don't know if mr spolina was intending on attending no, either. okay and then mr bracken and then um I can confer with Ms. Sarkis and Mr. Maselli. 
Okay. But so right now we would have possibly possibly four people. Mm -hmm. Leah, do you feel it's um, most important to have an opportunity to go first or to randomize? Yeah, I guess I you can do both. Well, quite we'll frankly, work, we'll work to see how we can do that yeah. in a time efficient way. But I was just asking in, in case we um, needed to prioritize just as the candidates. I'm just wondering, do you feel that it's you know, more important to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to go first or to be randomized. So what if I have the names in the basket and then for the first question, I'll pull a name and that person begins. But that's only if we ask five questions. Yeah, so it, well, it, I know, it that can be questions. done. I mean, here's the thing that can be randomized ahead of time. That's mm -hmm. just a quick little Excel. Right. Do you know what I mean? But so, I mean, the person I would, I think everybody should have an opportunity to go first, mm -hmm. but I do think it, it, Last You're only going first once. So you have to think you have four questions. There's four candidates and four, you go first once. Then after that, you're following the same, you're following after the same person every single time or speaking before the same person every time. How many questions did we do last year, Luna? We did three for three, right? Yeah. 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 We were so allotted only a specific amount, amount of time, time, like 35, yeah. 40 minutes. But this is, I mean, this is my right. one Seven. person's opinion. Right. If other people felt differently right. about it, then. To be honest, I. You know, when I went through that process and, you know, there were, I think, six of us that year, to me, it was important that we all had a chance to, to answer that question first. I think it really, I think it really is a great opportunity for all candidates to, to leave that question off, to, to be first, okay. you know, and be able to respond to a question quickly. I actually like that. Okay. Greg. Yeah. Would it be fair to ask our two candidates, Mr. Mayor, and Mrs. Spina, if they have any thoughts on what they would like to? Uh, it's not break protocol, but would you, would you mind? I'm, I'm Mr. Mayor, any thoughts on what you'd want to see at the I know I thought year. Last year was, you know, it was good. Everybody had an opportunity, and then we each had a chance to make a closing statement. Okay. Yep. So I think everyone one time was good. And then it was we all had time to do a closing statement. Are you gonna zoom in or you're just not gonna be here at all? What's that? Are you gonna zoom in or you're just not be here at all? I I could I'm not. These reservations you haven't got there six yet. Okay, now. that's fine. Yeah, I'm sorry, people over here. Yeah. Mr. Spolina, do you do you have any? No, I think honestly, you know, the randomization at the beginning is fine, and I think everybody should have the opportunity to at least possibly be first. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I mean, as long as everybody gets a chance for closing, I, that's cool. I'm cool with that. So I'm hearing. Um, in the way where there's an opportunity where everyone goes first it's important that everyone has an opportunity to close and we will talk about randomization and how we can yep. best accommodate that yep. and then Marcy, you were going to follow up with uh, megan sarkis as well to see if she'd be a and Mr. Russell, yeah. okay and can you just remind me marcy how we typically come up with the questions for this um that would be when that's so in the um, on the website we have the submit your questions um, mm -hmm. and we haven't had very much luck with that. Uh, we compile questions from previous years. We compile questions from the Monroe County School Board. They always have a bank of questions. So trying to figure out how much time we have and then what you kind of get a sense on the profile too on what is important for the candidates to try to streamline some of the issues that are facing the community. So we kind of try to combine like questions together. Yep. Thank you. Any other thoughts or questions? Yep. Thank you for your feedback. Thanks, yeah, guys, thank for you. your feedback. Appreciate it. Next on our agenda, um, I'm going to invite Jonathan to come up, is our all Paris safety study. As the board knows, we engaged in a uh, safety study this year with Alteris, which is a consultant uh, group that we used. Jonathan is going to share the process of that study, what that study looked like, and some of the recommendations coming out of that study. Thank you, everyone. Um, I will try to get through this in the allotted time. There's a lot of information. 
but I will say that we are in open session and this is being broadcast on the internet. So some of it has been scrubbed to, to, to not reveal some potential security holes or risks to students or staff. Um, so if you do have questions that are very specific to certain instances, we can pick that up in the session at another time, or I could always circle back in another manner um, based on what the superintendent uh, has reminded me. Um, so we engaged uh, a, a third party, Alteris Consulting, um, after a, a, a brief search from a couple of firms, they were able to help us uh, work towards prioritizing areas that we can uh, make improvements in our, in our security. Their goals are really to approach it from a layered approach. So they have a number of recommendations or areas for improvement that we can then prioritize and take a layered approach to in old, increase the overall level of security as opposed to maybe focusing on one aspect. For, that, for example, later in the presentation, you'll see that one possible area that they suggested is a student resource officer. That is a very expensive sort of endeavor where you could take that money and use it elsewhere. And that doesn't necessarily increase the security or the safety of all of the various buildings. It's just one aspect of what they have brought forth. Um, these are the goals that they have, and hopefully this has made it into your materials. This is just what they have on their website, trying to validate what we are doing is good, what needs areas have room for improvement, and what can be done at no or no cost. Uh, their report focused on five major areas, district-wide equipment, exterior, interior, and technology. Um, but then they broke these down also into short-term, mid-term, and long-term type of goals. Um, like I said, I'll try and go through these quickly. You can always review the PowerPoint at your leisure. Um, but uh, district-wide improvement opportunities in the short-term really focused on team membership, making certain revisions to safety plans at the district level and at the building level plans, assuring that uh, they're up to date. But they also made some suggestions from uh, for some additional areas that we could add into those plans, which are not necessarily required by New York State, just so that we can make some additional, uh, provide some additional guidance to our staff and, and families, really to our staff and helping them manage incidents. Um, Midterm <laughs> district-wide improvements focused on training, enhancing communication, um, communicating safety procedures within the code of conduct, drill completion, um, incident command training, that is, you know, a national program through, through NIMS and the ICS um, training system, but also uh, they mentioned increased security staffing in key areas. I put in key areas because I didn't want to identify any risks that we may have, but we do, they did specify two key locations that they thought additional security um, could be implemented. Um, Long-term uh, district-wide improvement opportunities, as I mentioned, the school resource program, school resource officer program, but also vestibule entrances. This is an, a known um, area of interest for all of our principals um, with respect to our buildings. Um, and we have uh, informed you of upcoming capital projects that we are working to plan for. So we anticipate the, ex the, the large expense that would come with each of those. And it varies by each building. Um, some buildings are easier than others to implement um, a vestibule type entrance, a secure entrance. Others, it's going to be very Mine's going to be tough. One. Yes. Yeah. Um, but they also right now have the most secure building. In a way. <laughs> um, but yes, there are some buildings that will require much more investment in making that change or uh, with the help of Ashley McGraw and, and long term planning, maybe making some other adjustments, which may alter which entrance is used or some other method of making that more <laughs> feasible. I don't know. It really comes down to all the things that come into that planning process. Um, equipment, short-term equipment changes. They're recommending safety vests at arrival and dismissal for staff, especially when it was dark um, in the, you know, January time frame. Um, parent drop-offs, just kind of a vest. You couldn't tell parents or teachers from standing out from the cars. Uh, flip charts, building go kits and parent reunification kits. Alteris is big on getting having staff trained in parent reunification. What is that? Parent reunification. 
So parent reunification, let's say we have an incident where we have to evacuate a school and our off-site location takes us to someplace, I'm not gonna identify it right now, um, takes us to another location. Parent reunification is the process you put in place at that other location to make sure that every student is accounted for, every parent has the right to pick up their student, and then it also incorporates the safety, the management of the entire facility, but also um, ensuring those students have any necessary counseling and other things that are going on during that process. So it is a complicated process, um, but there are um, outside agencies. There's a, a foundation called the I Love You Guys Foundation, which has a lot of material on their website and kits that you can purchase and, and implement with established plans for making this work. Or the kids turn me off there, so. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, and it really is kind of a go kit, you know, putting it in a, in, in a suitcase that a principal or administrator can take from Got the it. building. Yeah. Um, we had an incident a couple of years ago where we, we transitioned students, everyone out of the high school over into the middle school because someone smelled gas. It had come out of the atmosphere. There was no gas leak yeah. down. But that is the kind of incident where that additional planning for a go kit with rosters, medical information, other things and they have check for a checklist for all of this sure. and processes but those are the kind of things that we could work to assemble um and then find a place to store each of the buildings uh exterior wayfinding perimeter fencing um some areas just designating the outer um perimeter of our properties uh staging areas exterior lighting, doors and windows, ensuring that everything is adequate for um, securing those facilities and having people on the outside of those facilities. Uh, interior, uh, a couple policies, you know, policies so in, in dictating that st staff should keep doors locked at all times because um, as a member of our safety committee continues to remind us, the first thing that you lose in a emergency incident, um, such as a, an intruder, is your fine motor skills. So having the ability with the door lock, all you have to do is close it. That's much easier to do at the elementary level than maybe at the secondary level hmm. from the feedback that we've got. So, but their recommendation is a policy saying that. Now, whether that's a board policy or an internal policy still remains to be seen. Um, securing un unoccupied rooms, Electrical panels, Darren is all, our director of facilities already making sure that those, that the electrical panels are secured. Really, that's just a matter of making sure the custodians are making, are, are getting those electric, electrical panels locked in the locked position so that students don't have access to those. Um, but minor things which we're already working on. Um, room preparation, common area, large area security drills. Some, some buildings were doing this, some buildings weren't. You know, a fire drill for students during the time, during lunchtime or other areas where there may be an, a, an, an issue of supervision. <laughs> so do we have electrical panels in common areas? Aren't they all in like, they're so out in the open? <clears throat> we, even in this building, there's a, yeah. in, randomly in the hall. Just there. And <clears throat> that's just where yeah. things have been put in place. <clears throat> this, this, yeah, as, as upgrades have happened sure. and conduit and other things are run, it just, Got it, yeah, it's, it's just, just, just easier to design. A panel on the wall. Um, room numbering, where our Darren and his team are already working on room numbers for uh, outside buildings, um, lock sets, safety film in key locations. Technology, uh, additional visitor management uh, system trainings, lockdown panic system. Some of these are, you know, really suggestions of what they're seeing in other areas. Um, door jar sensors, security cameras, always uh, uh, an interest. VoIP phone system. If you recall, we did transition to a VoIP phone system a number of years ago, or just a couple of years ago. But this is really about integrating that into a call system and an emergency system. Um, because one thing that Alteris really likes to focus on is they want all staff empowered to initiate a lockdown because that helps reduce response time and get people into safety faster. So that is not something that we currently do. It's not something that I think many do. Um, but there are different ways of doing that, but we have to explore if we're gonna go down that path as part of our implementation of the various recommendations that they have. 
before I transition into the security survey that we did, do you have any questions on what I've put in front of you so far? Okay. Um, so to supplement the Alteris uh, review, it was suggested at our safety team uh, meeting that we do a little more outreach to our staff. So with Alteris's help, we put together a security survey, which went to, which was emailed to staff, which they could help, which they could respond to, which would help supplement our survey. So this security or supplement the assessment, the survey itself had a number of rating questions, but then also fill in the blank questions. Um, I'm not gonna bother you with all the fill in blank. There was at least 400 different answers with a variety of aspects from the extreme level of security that some people want to the moderate, you know, hey, we don't really need this kind of thing. But some of the things that we've already seen, like vestibule secure entrances, popped up a number of times. Um, as I said, the intent was to supplement the assessment. We did get 249 employee responses out of our, our large pool of employees. Teachers had the most number of responses, and you know, it's, if it's just based on building size, our highest number of responses came from the high school in Costco. Um, you'll have a chance to look at these, but really, what we're looking for is the blue and the green, um, as agree and strongly agree, and the staff primarily agreed or were strongly agreed with what we've done with threat assessment. Alteris was very impressed that we already have the threat assessment team in place, but they want us to continue that, make sure we have training ongoing, and just, you know, lauded that we have that going right now because there's still a number of districts that don't. Response and training leaves some um, room for us to address. Um, transparent communication following events. Sometimes there's only so much we can say regarding events. Um, Confident in the knowledge of training and staff to respond to emergency, very high. A um, little bit of area of training that we can do for staff who are supervising students outside of a building. Let's say you have an elementary teacher out on the playground, what happens if a drill goes off or the lockdown? A little bit of unsurety there. Uh, the lowest one at the, the, the one at the bottom, that is Alteris, is like I said, I feel empowered to put the building in the lockdown. That is not a standard that we have right now. But that is a question that Alteris recommended that we um, incorporate into the survey. And then security and supervision, really just a measure of um, the yellow isn't as a don't know. So for like after school, I'm kind of taking that as people may not have may not spend a lot of time after school, so they don't know about the level of security after school. Um, but security staff is visible after school hours. But either way, there's still a little bit of improvement that we could do with after school, but we know that with respect to after school time and supervision. Um, but during the day, security staff is accessible, visible and accessible during the school day, and they feel they have a safe learning environment during school hours. Um, I did a little bit of a, a word map, a word wall, if you will, with respect to, we had four questions that were fill in the blank. Um, this one with respect to what you would like to make your building safer, you can see from the large security top of the list, but other things, doors, door locks, cameras, and that really relates to the next question is one piece of equipment. You can see cameras pops right up there. We have security cameras. We are in the process of transitioning and upgrading those, but there's always room for improvement with respect to those. Um, then uh, I took a couple of responses, but rather than use the entire response, um, I incorporated some just without identifying the various buildings that these are coming from. Um, student backpacks um, was a potential issue for a couple of staff members. Mental health counselors, recommendations, lockdown trainings, updated door locks, security staff, classroom phones. Now each classroom has a way of contacting the office, but there was interest in having a more confidential way of contacting the office in some classrooms. Um, high school faculty parking lot, that's really about capital construction. We gotta, we gotta resurface that. Um, waiting room, that's vestibule. I, the rest of that was wording really about vestibule entrances and security <coughs> entrances, security cameras. And again, the threat assessment training that even I've mentioned is just keeping up to date with that 
And I know Ty had looked into that and I even emailed our last provider, but he's moved on to another company after he left Roberts Wesleyan. Um, I think there may be some room to get him to come back in, but I, I don't remember if it was free or not last time, but now there's gonna be a cost probably to, to get him to come back in because he's a private organization now. <coughs> Um, our next steps, we're communicating the results. We've presented this now to um, administrators, the safety team this afternoon, <coughs> yourselves uh, this evening. And now our job is to prioritize the results, take some of that prioritization, take it to the district, review it with the district safety committee, and hopefully come up with a plan, if you will, and then review that with administrators and solidify more of a plan that we can implement over the summer and into the beginning of the next school. Um, at the bottom here, this is also something that we did present to the administrators, proposed security changes. Um, so based on a little tweak to what I presented to admin council, based on some of the feedback that I had today at the safety committee, um, in yellow is essentially what um, has been proposed to be put into the, in the next budget. So our director of security, we currently do have a director of security. However, the proposal would be to incorporate that director of security as a district employee, as opposed to using uh, what we currently have as provided by a third party. Um, we do have the ability to go down that road. However, we do have options that we're exploring that we could have explored either continuing with the relationship that we have an internal employee or even all Paris has the ability to provide an additional individual. Just the, the on that process is way a bit more extended. Um, but then that director of security position essentially is more of a half response, half emergency management and planning. So more of an administrative level. So the thought is to have a senior security guard who can be the second in command, if you will, to help out with response and primarily focus on response really at the, second, at the secondary level. And then security four, um, you can see we already have three. I, after discussing with the safety committee, I've removed all the locations, so, so that's not identified. But we did add an individual mid-year this year, so security four is really to continue that into the next year and maintain that position um, because it's it's working well in the way we have it set up. Um, and then you can see the other stuff that we do have: traffic control, car patrol, weekend patrol. So again, a little vague on what's there. I can provide additional details in another forum if you're, if you're interested. Um, any questions about that? I just have one comment. You know, I'm a district uh, campus a lot with my son plays sports. I see a security car all the time. I mean, all the time. Sure. She's everywhere. Well, mm -hmm. she's everywhere. Where we're okay. Yeah. That we do have the car patrol uh, that helps out with, with those. Um, so. The only might not be in the right time, but the there is lots of distress over Cosgrove's drop off in general. I mean, it's it's kind of almost a you know if you think about people getting angry, there's going to be a spot because it's frequently a problem with backing up of traffic and getting people through the line quickly. And so I know that we have traffic patrol there, um, but there does get sometimes safety concerns with students crossing the main street to try to get to parents' cars over on the side or walking down the road to try to get to a parent's car that's in line for a long time. So I just, I'm sure it's being looked at, but. We, it, it really exploded when that first year of COVID. Um, and at one point it was backing up traffic all the way to district office. Yeah. So we. I used to be behind, yes. Yeah, so we then moved <laughs> it into the two lanes mm -hmm. to try and not block the driveways of the individuals, mm -hmm. especially the credit, credit, credit union and, and, mm -hmm. and the other residents there. But then yes, it does create a little bit of um, issue for the students. And if the parents don't want to wait in line, they are walking out into the street, mm -hmm. cars stopping all over the place. And we're limited essentially to our property. Our security can't really go out on the main road that's really the, the, you know, the purview of the police but until that creates an issue for them. How do we change that? I don't know. Uh, my recommendation is because we don't have the So it brings up a good question. <laughs> Crystal Ball, I, I know that the school drop-off spiked because of COVID. Do you think it's going to settle back down next year? I 
I, I couldn't answer that question, yeah, I know. But, I, but I would say these schools were designed in the 50s, 60s, 70s. They weren't, they weren't built with enough parking for staff and parents to be there on, open, on, an, on an open house. Especially. They, weren't, they weren't built with, with enough drop-off areas yeah. for what we have. So we have to work with what we have. Yeah. And you know, until we can come up with a better solution to that, um, really is that Cosgrove one also was affected by snow and you know the backup during the winter time. It's gonna take years if they get back to normal numbers, I think. Well, I was gonna share, Dave, I really think that that's um, more, you're going to see that more. I don't know if you're ever gonna go back to what pre, it, yeah, pre COVID or what it was. I think that that becomes a little bit more of. Uh, a community's pattern and you've got parents who work and are dropping off kids before work and in those types of situations um you know again this is also it, it's integrated in our k-12 master planning as well as we look at campus needs and we look at drop-off patterns and traffic control studies like those will be the areas in which we have those conversations if, if you think about when Cosgrove was built, okay, um, years and years ago, that front loop hasn't changed. And obviously the demands are so much yeah. different when that was originally designed, which takes us back to that master plan, yeah. taking a look at some of those areas that are challenging and how can we redesign those areas through a capital project to ensure student safety. Mm -hmm. So. I, I agree with you, Kristen. I don't think that this is gonna be a trend that we no. see go away. Um, I think parents have more flexibility in their work schedules now and the ability to drive to and from, so they just do and it becomes habitual. Uh, the other location, of course, I'm sure you're already looking at is the fact that um, Canal View and Burnaby yeah. share a drop off circle. Yeah. Very stressful. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs>
I believe. It doesn't just say graduation in terms of ceremony. All related graduation, which could be read to the which, mom a month and a half. Right. right. And yes. now I think that, that that would have to be considered. And I, and so I, I would rather have it. I, I personally would feel more comfortable with wording that allowed for that flexibility. That if there was a serious suspension right. issue where people did not feel that it was safe to have a student return to school property, that we had that ability. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, keeping that discretion within with the superintendent's hands um, mm -hmm. and possibly a recommendation from the hearing officers, not as I said, I didn't make recommendations like that, but prohibition of graduation in when I was doing hearings was very common for suspensions that happen after March. And, and it was used widely, not just for a weapon. It was used for fights. I'm not talking drugs, about you know other things. So dress code violation. Right. No, not like that. But, but any suspension that was a, a long-term suspension for a number of weeks often ended up in that. In that walking. In that walking. Right. Um, I even had a student approach me at who I had suspended approach me at the public market in the city. He was working a booth, and he said that he was proud that he got to attend graduation because he fulfilled. The requirements that the suspension that the superintendent put in place for him to come back early and attend graduation. That's the limitations of the current education law is it's mandated for suspension and everything else that comes with it is kind of you get an early return if you do all of these things. So it's just those it's the system that exists now, but leaving the discretion and adding that wording would definitely reinforce the, the discretion. Um, rights of non-custodial parents. This did prompt um, some discussion, and I think um, after your clarification, Ms. Stone, I think if we don't include the word elementary and just leave the policy as it is, because it uses the word release, yeah. we, but even the high school, gets permission from the parents to release the student out of the building on an early basis. It's not an all or nothing. Um, they do kind of sign themselves out, but there is a parental permission involved. So as long as we are not actively allowing it, you know, so yes, I think if we just leave that word elementary out, then I think that would suffice for what you were. Yeah, and I, and I would say with elementary too, I didn't say this at the time, but we do elementary school here, right, through five, but elementary as through six, right? So Cosgrove follows a different policy in terms of releasing students. No, Cosgrove also requires a parent to come in and, with permission. And I talked to the greeter today, and she checks Infinite Campus to see if there's any notations regarding parents and if there's a limitation on any of those parents picking up students. Um, but they would also essentially could also go to the office or the nurse's office or whatever. Okay. Um, but they are, Cosgrove, I think, is, from what I was able to discern, is more in line with the elementary than it was. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, then the last couple of policies that we had comments on was medication and personal care items. Um, really, Ms. Brown, it was about your comments regarding um, uh, feminine hygiene products. That was a, a, a law that went into place pre-COVID, I think it was 2018. We did go around and install dispensers in all the ladies' bathrooms and in, in the buildings. Um, but high school. I did in high school building. In six through twelve. Oh, six twelve, yeah. So in essence, the secondary. Yeah, exactly. Right, right, yeah. Um, but we do stock some, I checked with Mr. O'Connor, we mm -hmm. do stock some in the nurse's office, <clears throat> nurses' offices currently. Um, really though it's more for an emergency kind of basis. So if the board wanted to add a sentence which changed that is that from six to 12 to all grades, if you will, whatever age limit that would be, we, it would make ensure that it's continued forward. And then they would have to make sure that's part of their annual ordering process. I don't know if we, or we could put dispensers in the bathrooms. You couldn't, well, I would imagine oh, it's, it's, it's some classrooms have bathrooms in the classroom and some are in the hall. Yeah, not, the, not at the kindergarten. But I would still need. Right. But we could. I mean, in the health office. In the health, yeah. yeah. I think of adding right. extensions, I think it would be <clears throat> beneficial to have it to all students on support who require that. 
So we okay. have it, we have those um, supplies in our hot box. <coughs> And I think she's just saying they had a sentence to the policy stating oh, that sorry. those yeah, supplies would be available at the elementary school health office. Right. Yeah, so I would, I, my first thought would be to add a sentence which says that we will make them accessible mm -hmm. in, in, in a student health office at the elementary level, as opposed to dictating free, because that implies all the dispensers and all the other things that the kids would just play that thing. Okay. okay. Um, I apologize, the accidents and medical emergencies. So uh, I think this was a question regarding the medication. I think oh, I might have jumped ahead. group insurance one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, so when I read your question, I took group insurance to mean student accident insurance, which we do not carry. We're not required to carry that. Um, but um, in essence, we are not as far as I was able to discern from anyone, we're not responsible for payment of an ambulance or transport. Um, so if a student accident does take place, the family and their insurance is responsible for that ambulance transport. I don't know without exploring further into student accident insurance, even if those transports would be covered. From what I was able to, when I talked with Rick about it, those policies don't even necessarily cover the full amount. Well, I'm insurance. sure they don't. That's that's actually why I was asking. You know, if you if you call an ambulance to your house, do you know what I mean, for an emergency, the ambulance drivers will ask you, you know what I mean? Do we have permission? I know this from personal experience. Would you like us to transport? Because I said, why are you asking me? Because I was thinking, if it's you're determining a medical emergency, why are you asking me to transport? And the reason is payments. Famous. They're making right. sure that they have permission to bill you for that transport. So this was my, what, my question was stemming from this. So hypothetical, student breaks their leg on football field, right? Parents are not available by phone. We call an ambulance. Ambulance comes, transports the student. Parents have not approved of the transport. See what I'm saying? Because they weren't here. We called the ambulance. They get billed $3,000 for the ambulance trip and say, we can't pay that. We wouldn't have proved an ambulance. You should have just waited for us. That was that was where my that's why I was asking the question. I'm not saying it changed the policy. I was just asking if how does that end up being school district liability or not? That's a very good question. If the parents are going to bring suit against the district, we're going to turn it over to our is that that's how it would company. be handled. There's no backup insurance plan. That, that's that's what I was. I'm not suggesting necessarily change the policy. I was just asking if that's how it's handled. The parents is it, is it well because it's a well, I think that within the policy it states we're going to try to do everything we can to get in touch with the parents it does. only right. if at the absolute necessity of going through the ambulance and in that particular case you know that may be the the answer then yes we're going to transport them if the parents said no we didn't give you the authority to do that um, and they're going to pursue that through legal means we're going to turn that over to our insurance carrier. And I think, Leah, in that situation, you know, when we can't get a hold of parents, we are obligated as agents of the school district to step into that okay. parental role. So those would be situations in which, you know, unfortunately, we probably get our legal counsel involved, but we, we but we do have an obligation if we've done our due diligence, we can't get a hold of, of parents to act in that capacity. So we would have to do what's right for the child at that that point in time. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Except, we, except we're acting in that capacity, but we don't <coughs> accept payment in that capacity. You see what I'm saying? I, I do, but still we would, right. if we felt that it deemed to get an ambulance, we would have to get an ambulance and we probably have every right to do so. Yeah. Great. I think your last couple of questions we're about the next policy, but you also referenced the medication policy. So just because quick, they're all intertwined, that was the problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess when I rationalized this in my discussion with the superintendent, I likened it to uh, the school day. If a student has medications in the nurse's office, there could be anywhere in the high school and not necessarily in direct contact with the person with the medication. 
the same could apply to a field trip if a student, you know, if the, if the chaperone or the teacher has, or a nurse has the medications in one section of the museum, but the students are off in another section of the museum, then it's similar to the building. At the secondary level, they'd be able to call, chaperones would be able to call, students would have their own ability to call library with cell phones. Um, but I was also worried about getting in a situation where putting something in a policy would make it so stu any student with medication had to stay with one person. Well, no, I want to clarify, not medication. We're talking life-saving medication. So we're talking, you know, emergency you know, inhalers, EpiPen or whatever, you know, that type of medication. And I'm going to tell you where this comes from. I'm going to give, here's a real life example. You're at Genesee Country Museum in the spring. <laughs> And elementary students are eating, you know, jelly sandwiches and juice boxes, and there's bees everywhere. And you have a kid with a anaphylactic reaction to a bee sting, and now the EpiPen or EpiPen's a brand name, but just forgive me, right. um, is held with the teacher who is not assigned to the student who has the allergy. The teacher is somewhere in a Genesee Country Museum. Mm -hmm. So here's the issue. A student gets stung by a bee who requires that type of intervention. And you are at a facility that is large, that's not easy to find directions. So you're going to call a teacher on their cell phone. If they get the phone call, you're going to say, I have a student, they're in an emergency, and they're going to say, where are you? And I will tell you that it is not easy to describe where you are if you are I'm next to the horse field. I mean, it's it is um, problematic in develop in a timely response. So the reason I was asking is my feeling is, and I know that students there's a concern then about students not being with peers, but we're talking about students with a life saving medication. That if you are off site, that they should be assigned to the person who is holding the medicine. To me, that just seems like. I mean, it, I mean, to have it be somewhere else and to not have access to it is difficult. Quite frankly, I don't terribly love that the life-saving medications in the nurse's office when people are out on ball fields way away. I mean, I, truthfully, if you want my honest opinion, I don't like that either, but I'm talking about... Leah, you bring up a very good point. You, you bring up a very good point. I would hope that, though, there would be some kind of organized system put in place with these students that have these conditions and that whatever is required is with the employee that is supervising them. I would hope that that would be the case and there would be an organized process that that would be put in place prior to the field trip um, mm -hmm. taking place, I guess is what I'm, I'm saying. Me As too. an educator, I've been in that position. I've Me been too, in that I'm going to tell you on the flip side, it's that's and there's always an organized process through the nurse's office. I would hope that that those needs would be met immediately if that's, <laughs> if that's the case. I'd hope that would be what we would have in place. So, so you're asking me. I'm not asking. Yeah. I'm just, my point yeah, is I, no, was, I, I would really hope that, that yeah. would, something would be in place anytime a student does go on a field trip or leaves campus. And that's what, what Jonathan and I talked about. And I hear you, Leah, in regards to differentiating between the life-saving uh, mm -hmm. medicine. Absolutely. And, and just as I'm hearing and we're having this conversation, you know, again, so what Jonathan and I were talking about and grappling with is how do you make sure that the policy does not overextend that um now we've created a situation where all students who require medicine are linked together and then, then they don't have the freedom to be with classmates or their friends so we're trying to find that that right spot mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm just wondering because we haven't had this conversation mm -hmm. outside of what we're talking about tonight is it possibly we go back and you know discuss with our medical director see more medical guidance in regards to that um, and whether it be more procedures outside of the policy you know that we look to or what about this language in the policy i just would suggest to the board that we do our due diligence so we don't tip in the other way because i don't want to 
discriminate or confine children in any way as well. Yeah, I'll, I mean, I'd have to think about that. I mean, in terms of, I don't want to confine anybody either. Yeah. Um, what I don't want is what my, um, here's what well, this is what I don't want is that parents to then have to call other parents and say, You're, are you chaperoning a field trip? Can you carry my kid to rescue you and hail her? Because they're not assigned to so and so's group. Okay. That's what I don't want because that <coughs> we don't want other parents responsible for that. And we don't want parents sending kids on trips out of concern that they don't have what they need. And as they're older, they can carry it themselves. You know what I mean? But when we're talking about little ones, um, <coughs> they can't. So if you feel you know, comfortable with this, let us do a little bit more research mm -hmm. and uh, get some more guidance, both from the medical end, the legal end, and then bring those answers and conversation back to the board. Okay. Well, I think that was everything. And if anybody has any more questions, or whatever. Any other questions? Thank you, John. Right, thank you. Appreciate it. Moving on to our business and financial aspect of the evening. Um, so we have a pilot agreement. Um, Rich, I'm going to ask that you share information about that pilot agreement. I know you've been working with our attorneys for them, looking over um, that information. We'll answer any questions that the board might have and then um, look to a resolution. Okay, thanks, Kristen. So I'm not sure how familiar you are with this uh, solar energy RPTL 47. So in um, November of 2017, the board had adopted to opt out of this particular tax exemption. In 2019, they, we reversed that decision and we opted back in. So by opting back in, businesses are eligible for the tax exemption when they create a solar pilot. So that's the scenario we're in now. When you receive what's called uh, an intent to construct, then the district um, has to reply within a certain period of time to identify that uh, we'd like to enter into a pilot agreement. So in this particular scenario, all of that has been done. We've been working with a representative from Delaware River. They actually sent us this template, which has been used or has been um, provided to the Monroe County and the town of Greece. Uh, we've had uh, our attorneys review it. We then uh, submitted that uh, to you for approval. But in the meantime, we had provided that to um, the representative from Delaware River. Uh, they responded uh, Monday afternoon and said that they did not have any issues with what we have provided them. So uh, what we're asking for is approval uh, of the agreement um, and the approval for Ms. Swan to sign off on that. What this allows us to do is receive additional funds through a pilot agreement based on the actual um, megawatts of the solar project. So a mouthful, give you time to process. Rick, what's that letter about parties have a chance to look at or something? The so when I when this was um, provided in board docs on Friday, mm -hmm. at that point in time, I was just getting information and the revisions from the attorneys. I had not yet sent it to um, Delaware River representatives. Mm -hmm. I did that afterward and they got back to us. So this is old so, news then. So yeah, even though it it's a draft, I mean, okay. essentially they've approved it. They're comfortable with it. If you, the board is comfortable, we'll take this, have Ms. Swan sign it, send it to the Delaware rep representative, and we can wrap this up. And this is the same agreement. We just didn't have a provider for them, right? This is when it was approved in 2019. We just didn't have anybody constructing anything. Is that correct? No. So historically, we had a different solar farm that was um, yeah. doing that. Yes, if that answers your question. Yes, but right. Okay. Yes. Rick, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So the language says, unfortunately, the timing of events did not allow the final agreement to be completed and signed by all parties. That's not true anymore. 
but it's still true. I, I sent this to them. Right. They've reviewed it. Right. They said they're that with so, yeah. They okay. shared with me Monday afternoon okay. that they're comfortable with the changes that um, our attorneys, that we made through our attorneys. And then um, they reviewed it. They basically give you a thumbs up. We'll have to see you at this point. Yes. So, Rick, if we approve this tonight, nothing will change with this contract. It's going to say it is. Right. And of course, if something did change, we would come back to the table to discuss it. Correct? Yep. Okay. Okay. Motion to approve the pilot agreement. Okay. Any other questions, concerns? All in favor? Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And then finally, 8.9 our financial report. Financial report. All right, thank you again, Kristen. So um, on the revenue side, uh, a lot's changed. Uh, I think I shared with you before that I was hopeful that we would, we had submitted information for what they call stacks, it's um, public access cost aid uh, that has been recognized by the stack unit. So uh, that has increased um, by about $400,000, which is fantastic for us. Um, other than that, not much has changed uh, on the revenue side. I don't think there's gonna be a lot to change. And I said the variable right now is the sales tax. So I'll know more uh, come June. On the expense side, again, I've tried to take an opportunity to identify where I think we're gonna see savings. Um, so the majority of where these savings are coming from is salary. And then obviously through you know, less social security tax on that, um, and it's because we've been able to uh, fill certain positions or we've had resignations that I'm aware of, uh, quite a few resignations um, mid-year. That's where the majority of this is coming from. Um, now, I don't know if you guys um, hopefully saw I sent an email. Um, I did add a page, which uh, is the fund balance page, which is an attempt to share with you where I think we'll be, we'll be right now. The one thing I can guarantee is that number is going to change the next time we meet. So right now I'm projecting um, a fund balance surplus of about $75,000. Okay, so that's it on the general fund side. Any questions before I move to school lunch? Okay, so school lunch, um, I'm not sure that I've ever shared had this conversation with Twitter, <laughs> where we just we are actually looking to have a surplus this year uh, in large part because I had to look of at it three or four times to make sure I was reading it correctly. So we've had conversations with um, the external auditor as to um, you know how to address this because you're actually in the potential of having more surplus than you're allowed to. So um, in doing so, what we've done is identify <laughs> Um, particular uh, expenses um, within certain areas as it has gone throughout the year. Jonathan and Gary are also working on a plan for equipment. This has been long needed where Gary can begin to look at old equipment that we can potentially replace. The ob object really is to identify where we think we're going to be with a surplus, that, um, increase the budget by that amount, to come in and be able to address old equipment and manage the surplus. Um, so that's really a um, conversation that I've not had with the board since I've started here. So even though we don't have the school board adopt our school lunch program at the beginning of the year, um, by bringing this to you each month, you're really sort of a, adopting the increase in our recommendation of their budget. So it, it's an indirect. And, um, we flush this out with the external auditor. I think we're in good shape. Next month, we may come to you with a little bit different, um, maybe even a little bit more increase again as, as the year goes through and we identify where we think we're going to land. Um, so, I, again, I threw a lot at you right there, especially on the school lunch side. Any questions that you have? Good problem to have. Just yeah. so you know, the, the fund balance for school lunch is. Uh, <laughs> It's three months of average operating expense. It's not a per certain percentage like it is in the general fund. So. Okay. And on the topic of school lunch, it's still looking like next year we'll go back to regular. Okay. Yes. Yep. Okay. 
motion to accept the financial report. Anybody second? Okay. Any other questions? None. All in favor? Uh, David? No. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you. I get the motion. I think I'm done. <laughs> okay. Meeting evaluation. Anything we have covered? Yep. Yeah. Uh, this is covered. It's great to see students back in the room. I'm uh, looking forward to continuing that momentum with having those bright spots and having kids report to us and seeing families here. So really appreciate that. Um, any other feedback? All right. Um, Lori, would you like to? Sure, I make a motion to enter executive session for the purpose of discussing the employment history of particular persons. All in favor? 